So right now I'd like to hand it over to Tanya, the Director of Programs at Farm to Institution New England. Tanya will introduce our panelists and facilitate a conversation of the challenges and solutions in bringing seafood to institutions. Thanks so much, Kirby. Um, I'm, uh, I also want to thank everybody who's attending today. It's really great to have you all on board with us to learn more about seafood in New England and also within institutions and within our food system here in New England. As Kirby mentioned, I work at Farm to Institution New England, and we're a nonprofit network organization that brings together stakeholders, and we aim to leverage the power of institutions to transform our food system for the better. So our speakers have already that we've had so far have already really eloquently shared that seafood is a key part of the history and the future of New England's food system. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce the five panelists that we've invited for the final part of this really great day on New England seafood. They are here to help us identify very real challenges that exist in developing sustainable and successful sea to institution supply chains. They're going to be sharing their successes also and, um, and discussing ideas to help us build even more support for sustainable, equitable, and traceable seafood in the regional food system. I'm going to very briefly introduce each of the panelists, but then hand it over to them to tell you more about themselves and their work in their own words. Uh, I encourage you to check out their bios on our Sea Summit webpage for more info and to learn more from their own websites. Our panelists represent a number of key parts of the supply chain. Um, so first up, I'd like to introduce you to the producers on our panel. Joining us are Susie Flores. Uh, Susie is a former market development executive turned kelp farmer, and she and her husband Jay run the Stonington Kelp Company, which is the largest commercial seaweed farm in the state of Connecticut. So we're moving a little south in New England here. Bill Blount is also joining us. Bill is the captain and owner of the fishing vessel Ruthie B, which is a 77 foot stern trawler that he designed and built in the late seventies. And the boat is named for Bill's wife, Ruth. Bill has been fishing for over 50 years as an offshore commercial fisherman on Nantucket, on Nantucket and in 2018 actually moved to New Bedford. We also have Jamie Lionette, and Jamie represents the middle of the supply chain for us today. He's the director of the Sustainable Seafood Program at Red's Best, a Boston-based seafood wholesaler with a really unique business approach and a mission to support American fishermen while sustaining fisheries for harvest. And also with us are two truly amazing chefs. We're really glad to have you with us. Thanks, chefs. Chef uh, Tom Barton is the executive chef at Northeastern University, where he brings over 20 years of culinary experience, including working at different types of institutions, such as the Boston World Trade Center, the Royal Sinesta Hotel in Cambridge, and the Four Seasons and Ritz-Carlton Hotels. Kevin Gibbons has been the executive chef at UMass Dartmouth for over 10 years and has been a chef for over 20 years. Chef Kevin won several awards while working for Chartwells, which runs the dining program at both Northeastern and UMass Dartmouth, including their National Chef of the Year Award in 2016. And all of our panelists are really passionate advocates for seafood, for the ocean, and they're active in supporting their communities. So we're really glad to welcome you all and um, expect a really great conversation with you all today. So as I said, I want to invite each of our panelists to introduce themselves, um, to share a bit about their experience dealing with institutional supply chains, um, some of which is more extensive and some which is less extensive. And we'd like to hear about the value that you see in those institutional supply chains and also at least one key challenge that you've had to deal with over the years. Um, we're then going to dig deeper into those challenges and also into ways to how to over, over, um, overcome them together. And so first, I'd like to invite Susie to talk a little bit more about her work. Susie? Hey, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? All right, awesome. Since I can't um, walk and chew gum at the same time, I am going to be ignoring the chat and uh, the Q&A for now. And I'm also going to set a little timer because I can blab about this. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Um, thanks to all the wonderful speakers. It was so informative. I learned so much. I took like maybe a page and a half of notes. Um, and thank you for uh, to the team that set this operation up. This was really great. And I know how much hard work goes into all of this. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, so uh, I am a seaweed farmer. I grow sugar kelp in the Fisher's Island Sound with my husband, Jay. Um, he does most of the heavy lifting in terms of gear and then I kind of do everything else. 
Um, we have been farming, we're in our fourth year of farm. So we're still kind of in farm farming infancy. Uh, we started our farm in partnership with Green Wave, which is a nonprofit that works in uh, Connecticut with a lot of Connecticut, um, Rhode Island, Massachusetts farmers. And it's been quite a wild journey for us. Most of the seaweed that we grow is, we grow it to be a food product. We're regulated as seafood. So all of the um, testing that would go into an oyster fisherman, for instance, uh, is applied to our seafood or our seaweed the same way. So that being said, we have a really kind of pristine um, and beautiful, healthy crop that can absolutely be served on a plate without any uh, risks of you know, heavy metal contamination or anything like that. So we primarily grow for chefs to serve it uh, at restaurants, for um, folks at farmers markets to pick it up and bring it home and cook it themselves. Um, and then we will at times divert some of our seaweed to fertilizer use. So it kind of does this full circle loop just so we're not wasting anything at all. Um, it is a fantastic soil supplement. That's a whole nother topic for a whole nother day. Um, so in my experience farming seaweed here in the Fishers Island Sound, uh, I think that the biggest challenge we have really is educating the public as to what on earth we're growing and how people can use it in their kitchens at home. So like the stuff that Barton is doing is really fantastic because it really is something for me to point to and say like, you know, that's really not that complicated. It's something that can be um, easily added onto your plate. Sorry, someone of course decided to call me right now. Um, so uh, education is one of our biggest challenges, especially in a COVID world when I would be, you know, traveling around doing cooking demos, um, speaking at libraries, kind of, forcing people onto my boat so I'd have a captive audience to them while we drive out to the farm to get them to understand all of the different applications of seaweed. I try to sell it fresh raw, um, which means that I'm taking it from the ocean. We're kind of keeping an eye on it to make sure that there's not any imperfections on it and then giving it directly to chefs that way. Uh, we stabilized it in a dehydrator as well. So we'll sell it um, dried and then we can also blanch and flash freeze. Um, when it comes to, uh, so when you pull the seaweed out of the water, you instantly are presented a whole kind of um, slew of challenges that you have to plan for. So seaweed, obviously it's seafood. It wants to live in the water. You're taking it out of its natural environment. And so you have to account for that. You're um, making sure that it's temperature controlled. You're making sure that um, it's not getting any sort of direct sunlight covering, uh, hitting it. So there are a lot of logistical challenges that I've been learning to adapt with. And while we've been able to manage a lot of these challenges on a smaller scale in order for our operation to grow, we definitely need to kind of think outside of the box and consider larger investments. And I think that that's a struggle that a lot of the seaweed farmers in Southern New England experience because we don't have the same infrastructure that Maine has. It's not, um, it's not exactly the same uh, group of folks who are farming it. You know, I'm like I said, I am not a lobsterman. I you know exclusively grow seaweed. So, uh, making sure that we have the infrastructure to get the seaweed from point A to point B is definitely uh, a supply chain challenge that we have. Um, and then on top of that, getting the seaweed to a place where somebody who knows what to do with it and can actually, you know, do something at scale. You know, so for instance, at an institution where they can use the seaweed in a coleslaw or um, use the seaweed in a, um, add into a pasta dish, you know, it's, it's that whole uh, educational piece as well, which is another challenge. I feel like this five minutes went by really fast. So um, uh, if there's anything else that you'd like me to speak to Tanya, just let me know and I can kind of add on to it later, but I do think I need to hand the reins back over. Thanks, Susie. Thanks for giving us that overview of your work. And um, we are gonna, you started bringing something up that I think we're gonna address a little bit more in the Q&A. So no worries, we'll get, we'll get to as much as we can. Um, now I'd like to hang, hand things over to Bill. Bill? You need to unmute yourself, Bill. Let's see, I can do it. Oh, no, we can't, you can do it. Are you able to, there you go. Yeah, how's that? Huh. Great, thanks. Great. Uh, my name is Bill Blount. Uh, I have, um, you've introduced a lot of things I was going to say, but uh, <laughs> I own the fishing vessel Ruthie B. Uh, primarily, I have done ground fishing and I started full time. I started fishing when I was seven at in 1952. 
I've been uh, fished most of my summers then. And then in 1970, I went full-time uh, ground fishing. And I've been, I've done, played around with uh, clams. I've played around with scallops and a number of other fisheries, but sword fishing, whatever. But primarily I've done ground fishing and that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, ground fishing is the uh, traditional fish caught in New England fishing grounds, like uh, as um, Barton had said, uh, cod, haddock, flounders, halibut, uh, white hake, pollock, there's about 18 or 20 different species that all fall into that. And uh, I tow a net behind my boat and um, um, I was, for a number of years, I lived in Nantucket, 43 years. We've just uh, recently moved to New Bedford, but while I was in, uh, and I'm part of the New Bedford fleet now, but while I was in Nantucket, uh, I was trying to uh, work directly with the community. And so, um, well, right now I have full uh, commercial fishing permits and dealer permits. So it's all legal uh, to uh, in both the state and, and federal uh, levels. And anyway, so I, I was beginning to, uh, what I want to do is just reach directly with the uh, with the public. And uh, I, I was looking for getting for one, trying to get the best price I could, but also um, because of the regulations and stuff from the government and everything, I was looking to get, looking, seeking political protection, you know? And so I wanted to involve uh, people in, in my business and everything. And so uh, what I did is uh, I started a CSF. It's a commercial community supported fishery. I don't know if you're probably be familiar with that. Um, uh, it's where you uh, have, uh, 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 some people would can either buy in either one, three or five shares. Uh, they would uh, pay me uh, $50 a share. And then I would give them 10 pounds of whole fish. And uh, so when I left the dock, they could call it. They would, uh, they would get an email saying that I was leaving the dock. I tell them when they plan to come in, uh, then on the way in, I'd, I'd email my, uh, my, have my wife email them and say that they'd be in such a time. And so while I was out, if they decided they wanted one of those shares, they could cash in and otherwise not. Anyway, I would, would begin dealing directly with people and, and involving them with that. Also, I tried uh, selling directly to fish markets and to uh, uh, restaurants and to, uh, I was on Nantucket, so there weren't too many institutions there. <laughs> Uh, I did some uh, 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 fundraising. I helped us support some fundraising activities, but whatever. But anyway, I, I've tried to deal with this, how to deal directly with, with people, with uh, a smaller like restaurants and stuff like that. And, and so I have some of the, maybe be able to help with some of it. I haven't really dealt with institutions, but, but uh, uh, and in a, in a way I have, I guess I sell in the auction into Bedford here and, and they would have access to me there that way. But uh, anyway, I, I have some insights I've, I've in, in, in this dealing with, between uh, directly from the boat into the market. Thanks, Bill. Really appreciate you um, sharing all that perspective. And I think talking about those different markets are part of that big picture. And um, as you said, um, you don't always have the full insight into where your fish is going after you, depending on where you're selling it. And so um, moving up through the supply chain, we're gonna now talk to Jamie, who's kind of in that middle role. And um, so Jamie, if you could also tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience dealing with institutional supply chains, what that looks from the supplier perspective. Great, thank you. So uh, I'm Jamie Lionetti from uh, Red's Best. And so what we do is um, we have our own we're, we have our own docks. We're on the Fish Pier in Boston. We have a uh, spot on, in Chatham, right on the pier, New Bedford, Martha's Vineyard. We have trucks running up and down the coast 24/7, um, unloading. You know, in Woods Hole. We're in P Town every night, unloading all the day boats, scallop boats. And what we do and what we focus on is we specialize on is what's landed in New England. You know, we don't move boxes. Um, we don't really do any importing at all. We do very minimal exporting. Uh, and what we do, our whole purpose we've been around for about 10, 10 years or so is really our mantra is fishermen first. We're really there to try to make sure that fishermen are making living wages um, and that the fish is being treated respectfully and brought to the right place, adding values to it. Um, and so before I jump into the institutional part, what that means is we don't tell anyone what to fish. We don't own any boats. We work 
you know, um, we work with what's going to work with the, with the fleet. Uh, so, you know, right before I left, worked this morning on the pier, the last thing I saw was some digger uh, in Cape Cod brought in 27 pounds of, um, of a, a stub razor clam, a, a jackknife clam, very obscure clam that shows up here. And right next to that was, you know, I had 6,000 pounds of haddock that came in that was being cut for institutions and universities around. Uh, so we deal with all sorts of fishermen, all sorts, you know, we do focus mostly on the medium and smaller size boats and fleet, uh, merely just because we're not that, that old, we're only 10 years, uh, 10, 15 years, or 12 years, I think is the exact number we've been operating. Uh, so our whole purpose is to find a place for all of this. And remember, this is wild fish that we deal with. You know, it's the last bastion of wild food that we have in our diet. Um, and we don't control it. We can't call the ocean um, and tell them what our par inventories need to be. Um, and so everyone here knows this, you know, the price of fish changes every day. It's all supply and demand. Um, it's all about aligning that. And so when you have, you know, a high, high demand and a low supply, that's going to really mess up pricing. Um, and what we found is, is that in the middle, we're just, we're the, we're the bad guys always in that situation. The boat's not getting enough money and the, the chef or, or, or the, the, the other distributor is paying too much. And it's always brought up craziness because everyone's had this kind of this modern kind of first world concept of food, which is that the, the, uh, that the demand should dictate the supply. Now, um, I know some, we've already spoken about certifications and, and my belief of, of the terminology of sustainability uh, is that you're eating in a way in which it is actually the supply that dictates the demand. That what is landed is what it is that we eat. Um, and so it can be very frustrating if someone says, well, I gotta have cod next Friday. We have no idea if any cod's gonna show on Friday. Um, and so we're trying to get back the living wages to the fleet, as well as find places for all this fish that comes in and tell the fishermen, catch what's abundant, catch what's out there, uh, and not stress what you think you have to catch. Don't go looking for cod because you think that. Uh, and so that's why we'll get in seven pounds of scup one day. And then, you know, three weeks later, squid season starts and all of a sudden we have 7,000 pounds of scup. So we always have outlets for that. So now, how that falls into institutional dining um, is that here are customers who have a large demand, a large supply, and a very, very typically a very, and I'm sure the next, uh, you yeah, have the privilege of working with Chef Tom and Kevin, and a lot of other chefs are probably on this, um, um, on this uh, conference, uh, that they have a very tight budget, a very limited budget on what they can do for large scale dining. And this is actually perfect, because remember in New England, our cash crop is seafood. So, you know, someone mentioned black sea bass before, striped bass and, and U10 scallops, which are, if you know right now, it's, it's record highs. It's absurd how much people are paying in the auctions for it for a variety of reasons. But you don't have to have, and you always think of local and sustainable as expensive, but that, it's our cash crop in New England. There's always seafood that is going to be for all price points and available. And the majority of it is actually going to be affordable and inclusive to all folks, especially at the institutional level. Now, the way it works is, and this is the, the programs we've designed with, with the healthcare sector, with public schools, um, private, private schools, uh, and uh, universities as well, is we, we, you know, we obviously work with the chefs, we have an understanding of their needs, and we say, let us make the decision for you. So if there's a day when you know, everybody's out there getting haddock, the haddock price plummets, but everybody want to cod that day, all of a sudden the fishermen can actually lose money because uh, the supply and demand aren't regulated. I mean, they're not aligned, rather. And so what can happen there is, is they'll lose money fishing. So what we do is we say, let us take care. We'll handle the poundage. You tell me you need 800 pounds of filet. We'll take care of that. Let us figure it out for you. And so then that day when everybody hit haddock and that price has plummeted, we can kind of put a, a floor pricing model back to the boats because on the other side of the equation, we have gone and locked a price in at the institutional dining. Um, so the, those chefs are able to forecast their food costs, which is impossible to do with wild seafood. You cannot forecast your food costs with wild fish because it changes every day, unless you give some flexibility on the demand side of it. And so we're able to do that where we can get the living wage back based on what's most abundant that day, bring fish 24 hours off the boat into the kitchen, into these institutional dinings because of how we've set up our whole logistical program. And on top of it, because we are the ones who unload the boats, we are able to give this data that we have to give because we're the unloaders, we have to give to NOAA, you know, the regulating body, um, all the catch data. So we're able to say right with this simple QR code technology, right to the chefs at the institutions to let their students know that Bob Eldridge on the unicorn caught their haddock uh, in Chatham and, and he's a gill netter. This is all the data we give right away when we land it. Uh, and so what that does is it allows the student body, especially the younger kids, 
uh, to see a, a wide variety. You know, we heard underutilized species before when, when Kate was speaking. And I think what's important is like, you know, you look at that, you say, oh, well, dogfish was the one to eat two years ago. You can't say that dogfish is always underutilized because this year it's more likely going to be skate than monk because it's always changing what's going to be most available and what it is that we really have a high abundance of and what it is that we should be eating. And so we work with the chefs to kind of work with recipes. But I think Kate, before I mentioned it, it's right when I came on, she was talking about utilized they're interchangeable to all these recipes. You know, you can have your, your, your standard recipe and Paula cake, haddock, whatever it may be, you can interchange it. But then when you're letting your student body know who it is that caught their fish, you know, we have these great experiences, for, we've been doing it for seven years now, where chefs were coming up to us at first saying, well, students don't know what hake is, they're not gonna eat it. And then three years later, they're saying, hey, you know what, they've had a lot of hake, can you give us something else? And when you hear a 17 year old saying, we love hake, but what else is there? And we say, here's skate, here's monk. And they get excited about it. They then go to Northeastern University or to UMass Dartmouth. And there the expectation is, we know the name of who caught the fish and we know there's a wide variety. And then when they leave those institutions, there's now another expectation that we should have local fish. We should know where it's coming from. Um, and we should, we should know who caught it. Uh, and I think this is really, really one of the really kind of important things is that when folks talk about, you know, the fish industry, we always get a lot of black eyes that we're overfishing and all these things. I think we should be proud of a couple of things. And one is that the Northwest Atlantic is the most regulated body in the history of humanity. Uh, there's a lot of really smart people in the last 20, 30 years who regulate it. And so we should feel very comfortable knowing that something that's caught in New England is actually going to, the biomass is growing every year because it's so well regulated. Um, and so there's these great opportunities to really bring wild seafood back into the diet, bring the community-based food supply back in. Um, and then bottom line for the chefs is that they're getting, they're, they can meet their food costs and the kitchen, uh, the, the fishermen rather, uh, can get living wages. And so that really brings the, this kind of brilliant solution by just doing this, uh, 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 flipping the model to allow the supply to dictate the demand of what it is that we eat. And so that's, uh, a nutshell, the, the institutional aspect. On the last quick thing, and this will come up, the other great thing is in the wintertime, that's when it's a lot of these great white fish is what's being caught most, and that's when school's in session. And so there's this great way of being able to unload these thousands of pounds of white fish into the schools, um, whereas in the summertime, there's not as much pollock or haddock around. Um, that's where the summer, you know, tourist resort areas and the beach fronts are getting your striped bass and all the kind of migratory summer ones. So it, it helps the kind of year-round balance as well. Uh, which isn't something that we should overlook either. But, uh, I feel Thank like you so much, Jamie. Um, I hope that all the dining directors and nutritionists and folks um, working at institutions who are on the line with us are taking note, because it is such a struggle to, um, you know, to have a local foods program during the school year uh, in New England. Um, but seafood is an is an amazing thing to focus on in these cold um, months where little is growing in the ground anyway. Um, thank you. Um, okay, I would like to hand things over to um, Tom now. And Tom, um, you know, you are clearly someone who's um, been committed to this whole idea of bringing seafood into institutions. And um, I'd love for you to also touch a little bit on um, both you and Kevin to touch a little bit on your work within um, the framework of the New England Food Vision Prize that um, your institutions were part of. Tom? Sure thing. Can you hear me okay? We can, thanks. Great. Um, well, this is, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm the chef here at Northeastern, and uh, we were one of the four schools uh, that were awarded the 2018, the um, Kendall Food Vision Prize, along with, you know, Kevin at UMass Dartmouth, uh, Mass Maritime in Eastern Connecticut State. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, you know, we work, we do technically work for uh, Chartwells, you know, higher ed, which rolls up into Compass Group. Um, and one of the one of the challenges, <laughs> Kevin and I were speaking about this the other day, and not wanting to uh, poke the bear, so to speak. Um, but one of the challenges working for a large company like this is working with the purchasing arm of our company. You know, purchasing is a is a revenue producing part of the company, a very important part of the company. And you know, they you know so, sometimes it's hard to help help. <laughs> sometimes it's hard to help them understand, you know, the value of, you know, working with, you know, somebody like Reds or a small local grower or producer, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. So that, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but that, you know, that's been some of the challenge. 
Um, another challenge that we had, and I think Jamie just said it, was to help educate our students on some of the varieties, you know, that they've, you know, for many years, they've, you know, everybody's familiar with cod and some of the more, you know, flakier whitefish, but, you know, what, what is a monkfish? You know, Jamie has come to the school, has come to our campus and uh, set up tables and let students see what a monkfish looks like and talk to them about it. You know, ocean redfish, uh, skate wings, um, ocean perch, should I say, sorry. Um, so what are some of these other underutilized species that we're using? And you know, we've developed a set of recipes that would um, that lend themselves pretty much to anything. We, a lot of times we don't know what it is uh, gonna show up. We just know that we've ordered you know, 150, 200 pounds of something. And we don't know what it is until it gets here. And so we've developed a set of recipes that would lend itself pretty well to any, any one of those recipes. Uh, and that, and to, as a chef, you know, for me, that's exciting. You know, like, wow, well, you know, what, what am I gonna get today? What's it gonna be? And, uh, and it's great. And the, and the piece that Jamie mentioned about the, um, the QR code, that's, I don't want to say genius, but I mean, that's, you know, our students, everything, I think everybody knows here on the panel, but also those listening uh, and watching know that, you know, students want a story. It's got to be a story behind everything. And, you know, I think that helps us tell the story. As we like to say, you know, the information Jamie gets to us is pretty much, you know, it's, you know, is pretty ex except every everything what the captain had for breakfast. You know, name of the boat. You know, name of the captain. Name of the boat. How it was caught. And I think Kate spoke about that. You know, the importance of you know some of the fishing methods that are out there uh, are being had are, are more important. And students are interested in that. I mean, you'd be surprised. Um, and again, especially when you know Reds comes and you know sets up their table as just a kind of a swarm of students who you know want to learn more about it. And it's uh, and it's great. All right, Kevin, um, love to hear what you have to add from, from the perspective at your university too. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Kevin Gibbons. And like uh, Tom said, we work for Chartwell's Higher Education. Currently I'm at the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth. And uh, a little bit about me is I haven't been in the industry as long as most people are that are my age. I, uh, it's a midlife change for me. When I was in my forties, I went back to college and uh, back into the kitchen, started in the kitchens and have moved through this. and through the Kendall Foundation a couple of years ago when we were awarded this prize. It was uh, building the friendships and understanding all about uh, the seafood is, uh, is pretty amazing. I've talked to Jamie many times. I can remember one of the great lines that Jamie said is we had to, uh, we had this small competition down in the middle of New Bedford. We had a cook-off and the, we had, uh, we didn't know what the, we knew the ingredient was fish, but we didn't know what kind of fish. And sure enough, when the fisherman came in and opened up the cooler, it was monkfish. And I can remember my partner that was with me, Chef Helder Costa, he looked at me, he tapped me on the side and he said, what the hell are we going to do with that? You know, but uh, we had, a, you know, we ended up having a great time, you know, 40 minutes, get it done. There's a whole people from New Bedford watching. And we wanted to replicate that again at UMass Dartmouth. And I remember calling Jamie and saying, uh, you know, can you get me some monkfish? Uh, we're going to do a competition. He said to me, Kevin, it's still swimming. Uh, I don't know if they're going to have it caught that day. You might have something else. Then I, I love that line to uh, share to the students. It's still swimming. It's out there. And um, like Tom said, we have a captive audience. And what Jamie had done is, you know, we can say, okay, every Wednesday we want 160 pounds of fish, but we don't know what it is. And it's a white fish, like Barton was saying, you know, sell the dish, not the fish. And then our, our cooks have the pleasure of, you know, working with skate wing, redfish, whatever came in. And Tom is, you know, we've talked all the time. We interchange recipes and, and the students are, are very, very much uh, inquisitive of where it came from, what it is, how it is. Um, and you know, you, you really sometimes don't know if you're making a change or not, but the last time I was at the Fine Institute was at UMass Amherst. And I remember in one of the breakout rooms, um, there was a fisherman there and he said, oh, you're the chef from UMass Dartmouth that take the monkfish. You know, we used to throw that back in the water. And uh, you know, now we know that you guys will take over a hundred pounds. And there's a guy from Cape Cod that's explaining to me uh, that we changed, we made a change there. And then I go downstairs and I run into Jamie and he's asking me if, it, you know, if you see monkfish and you pull the skin off, there's a slight film on it. That's like uh, a tenderloin and beef. It's got a silver skin. And Jamie actually asked me, 
are we taking enough of that silver skin off? Does the chefs have to do that at your place? So the communication of getting it to the Institute and here, uh, and again, our captive audience is, uh, is what we do here. And um, I think we can uh, move from that. Thank you. Yeah, Chef, that's great. Thank you. I really appreciate all the perspectives you're sharing. There's so much to dig into. Um, just to kind of recap so we don't forget, I think some of the things that um, you all were bringing up include things like um, being able to get institutions familiar with products that, um, and maybe things that are less familiar to them. Knowing where your fish is going um, or where it's coming from are also questions that even in smaller supply chains, um, are sometimes kind of challenging. Working with the supply and not the demand as Jamie so eloquently described, I think. And then um, also, you know, uh, chefs, you talked a little bit about working within an institutional setting and within a food service management company as well. And you know, there's, there's competing demands and interests and voices that have to be paid attention to in all of that. So there's a lot, a lot to unpack in all of those things. Um, but Chef Kevin, you raised something that I would really love to just dig into a little bit more with all of you. And that is that um, there's still, even, even if you're sort of working in this seafood supply chain for some time, I think there's still a learning curve to all of this and a lot to learn from each other. And um, that communication piece you brought up, Chef Kevin, I think is important. And I'd love to just kind of pose this question to each of you about what is something that you really wish that others in the supply chain understood about the needs that that you have. Um, and, you know, that's a pretty big open quest, open ended question. But certainly from Fine's perspective, these are things that we hear a lot of, of like, this is what the institutional needs are, if only we could X or from a producer perspective, you know, why can't institutions just X? Why is this so hard? So I'd love to just sort of dig into those questions a little bit and have you share some of that with our audience. Um, since we, we did um, leave off with Kevin and Tom, I'm wondering if you want to share a little bit about that right now from the institutional perspective. Um, yeah, sure, I will, uh, I'll start off. As like Tom said, um, we can't, you know, there would be nothing better for me to, you know, head down to the docks and buy six striped bass, sling them back and throw them on the kitchen on the table and, uh, and fillet them up and serve them. We, you know, um, it's hard, it's a payment thing. It has to be vetted. And, and like Tom said, um, it, it, it has to go through corporate. That's probably the biggest hurdle right there. Jamie has made some inroads. I mean, we can buy it off our broadliner now on, Monday, on days if we give enough of a notice. And, um, and a, a big change for us over the last couple of years was Farm Fresh Rhode Island. Um, they were, if you think about you know, not, not only in the seafood, but in the, all the growers and the agriculture and the fruits and vegetables, you know, there's so many out there. How can we possibly pay every little vendor, all the checks that needed? So it all had to come into one and then we would, uh, we, we would pay them. And then that one would pay everyone. And, and Red's, uh, Jamie came into Farm Fresh Rhode Island down there. And that made a big change for a lot of us here. And, um, I think that was one of the hurdles. How about you, Tom? Yeah, exactly. I think that was the entry point. You know, we, we uh, you know, continue to fight, you know, to, to try and get, you know, Red's product or some, some other local product. Um, but, you know, we couldn't get it done, but that was the way it got done was, you know, using, utilizing one of our ag aggregators, you know, as Kevin said, you know, Farm Fresh Rhode Island. Um, now, you know, we, we can get it through our broadliner, which is amazing. As long as we remember to place the order on time, <laughs> which can be... <laughs> be a challenge sometimes. Uh, one, of, one of the other things I think I would want, you know, our suppliers to under, supply chain to understand, and uh, Jamie alluded to this a little bit earlier, was the, um, um, the volume. You know, when, when they're, you know, when you're in peak season, in the middle of the summer, and, you know, boats are coming probably left, right, and center, you know, we're at our slowest point. You know, like many colleges and campuses these days, we don't close up, close up all of our doors, but, uh, you know, our volume is at a, at a fraction of what it usually is. Um, and while we can still use product, it's not, you know what I mean? So, you know, sometimes the season doesn't match up that way. You know, we, we pick right up in the fall and, you know, here we are in the, in the winter still, you know, still going, but um, sometimes the volume can be a little challenging. 
The other thing I would say also is that uh, we talked about the storytelling, which is important. And it, it, it's, it's just, a, I would reemphasize that. It's just really important. You know, I can think of one of our suppliers, not in, sea, not in seafood, but, you know, in one of our main produce suppliers actually, you know, has be able to, you know, ha has the reach to, to get other, um, you know, more local produce. But sometimes when you talk to them about, hey, what, you know, who's the, you know, what farm did this come from or whatever, they kind of strip the identity away from that farmer because they're repackaging the product, packaging it in their own boxes. And it's really hard to tell like, oh, I got it, you know, because we want to tell that story of the, you know, the small farmers and, you know, from all around New England. And sometimes it gets, you know, hard to, to tell that, you know, when that stuff like that happens. So uh, any, any bits and pieces that we, any little nuggets of information that we can get about um, you know, the product, the farm, or where it was grown, how it was grown, anything uh, is, is very valuable. That's great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give Susie and Bill the same opportunity to talk a little bit about what it is that, you know, you'd really like, um, oh, excuse me, buyers to understand about things from your perspective. And um, you feel free to offer that as a comment or a question, whichever way you think makes most sense. Susie, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, so, I think that from my perspective as a seaweed farmer, uh, much like Tom said, the kind of seasonality of when they have their busy season, when they have you know their most demand, seaweed is a winter crop. We outplant in November. Um, we are uh, tested and you know regulated usually in um, regulated meaning um, we take our regulators out to the seaweed farm and they run all of the tests on our sugar cup to make sure that it is of the you know utmost quality. Um, and then once I get those results back, it's usually mid-March. And so that is my season. My season starts in March and it ends, you know, by Memorial Day. So I think very often I get a lot of interest, you know, in June and July for fresh kelp. And that's just something that I don't have available anymore. So really making sure that the seasonality of it, um, you know, is at the forefront of mind. You know, you're eating with the ecosystem. So you want to make sure that you're eating what's in season in that moment. And also... Um, uh, some Farm Fresh was one of the organizations that for me really gave me access to all of these institutions that I otherwise would not have been able to um, reach out to. And they also had the infrastructure to take my seaweed and, you know, deliver it to a location in a reefer truck. That's something that, you know, we don't have as part of our farming equipment. So that was really a big, um, that was really a big step up for us in the right direction. Uh, the problem with farm fresh is just that they don't have as broad of a reach as I would like them to have. You know, they are, I think they go along the 95 corridors. So there are certain places where, you know, they just don't deliver to. So um, I think just thinking about those uh, infrastructure challenges, but especially considering the seasonality of what, at least for seaweed, we have to offer. And I would imagine that applies as well with certain fish that are going to be in season certain times of year. Bill, can you unmute yourself real quick? There, oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, the positive side, um, as I said, I had started a CSF. I began to work, I was trying to work with the community and, and uh, you talk about the stories and, the, and you know, uh, uh, we're, um, uh, just you know about what you're dealing where it's coming from and everything and that's one of the things I really enjoyed um I've always been a kind of wheel of dealer <laughs> and I've always enjoyed I really enjoyed involving the people in um uh so they know what they were getting they and and you know they saw what they were doing they heard the stories of how I did the fishing and everything and and uh, also, I took real pleasure in giving them a really good product, something they really were impressed with. And, and so it was that relationship with the people that, that, that I was trying to sell to, or the restaurant owner, or the chef, that I, I really enjoyed doing. Um, and uh, the other thing I want to say is uh, to uh, Jamie, I, I, I really appreciate the fact that you buy only local fish in New England. And uh, I believe you do buy my fish once in a while in the auction. I, I hear, I hear, I said, I said, who bought that? Who paid all that money? And said, best, best. You know, that was great. <clears throat> and, and, and you do buy in the high end a lot of the times too. And I appreciate that. But also you're absolutely right that um, as far as institutions, um, we go through these uh, shortages, which makes a tremendously high price, but you also go th through gluts. And, and if you're, Jamie, you're able to have a, a, 
a bottom line price on Haddock or something like that. When 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 that bottom uh, the market just totally collapses, it's able to hold up so that we we don't get totally killed <laughs> on the price and get nothing for our fish. And so um, that's a, this institutions are really important for that because what they do is they they put a a, a bottom line on how far fish will drop down, and it gives people like like Red's Best an ability to keep that totally from collapsing. And we need that because we're, we're uh, there's uh, dragging in New England has really been uh, brought, uh, there's almost hardly any boats left doing it right now um, because of regulations and different things. And so we're really struggled. We have a lot more expenses from the government um, uh, in, our, in our settlements, like with observers and uh, uh, quotas and stuff like that we have to pay. And so um, we're, most of us are not making a lot of money. And so um, that help in supporting us is, is extremely important. We really, 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 really appreciate it. Um, there's a number of things that we're obviously we're up against. Um, uh, I, I, again, you did this, as, as Jamie said, you know, we don't know what's, <laughs> you know, you don't, I mean, it is just a, it, it being able to consistently deliver a product is really difficult um, because uh, there all is these movements in fish and everything. And so um, uh, that's that's one thing we're up against. I mean, we're, um, we've got high expenses. We got um, the legally, there's, there's, there's a lot of regulations that control us, but, but anyway, um, that's, that's the things we're up against, I guess, right now, so. Thanks, Bill. Okay, Jamie, your turn. You've got both ends of the supply chain to talk to you now. <laughs> right, so I, just real quick, like to, to put a cool story in, because Kevin, when you said you can't just go down to the docks in New Bedford and get some striped bass. So it was this summer, Chef Tom came in one morning to get some you know, small amount because it's summer school. He says, it was your, your cousin or your nephew just started, got, just got his license, just gonna start going out striped bass fishing. So it's Monday or Thursday. Like, you know, just you ever think about it. I kid you not, three hours after Tom left the dock, his, his your nephew shows up. He's got five stripers right there, and he's all excited because it's one of his first days. That's the season, I think it was, right? Yeah. yeah. So that, you know, those kind of those kind of uh, collaborations are really great to show that is a, a true community um, food source, uh, food, uh, food supply. Um, as far as, again, I, I don't know what so much to add to this um, other than, you know, I think, just to kind of really bring back at the institutional level that, that you know, I, I, I actually for the meat industry, I did all local meats. I had a butcher shop in the South End for years uh, in Boston. And um, I remember Pete's Greens up in, uh, way up in Vermont, they had their slogan on all their, their, their salad mixes that said, you know, Vermont can feed itself or New England can feed itself. And I think about the institution, there's not enough chickens in New England to allow like uni uh, Northeastern University to give chicken to everybody in a single day. But what's brilliant about seafood, especially during the school year, is there's enough seafood landed in New England pretty much to feed every public school and university that we, And that's what we always kind of seem to step away from, um, that we forget, you know, we, I'm sure at some point everyone's heard what 90% of seafood gets exported, 90% we eat is imported. We forget that there is so much amazing seafood that's, that we're truly connected to and we overlook it. Um, and I can just think that, you know, people have been on panels before, they say, well, where's the best place to get seafood? And, and with a huge amount of pride, I love saying, you know, pre-COVID days, you know, go to any public school citywide in Springfield, Massachusetts on the third Thursday of the month, and you'll get fish that was landed that, the day prior. Go into Cambridge public school system, K through eight, you know, the, the, the lower, the grammar schools, and you'll be able to get some fresh white fish that was caught you know, there, that's your freshest, you know, and all these great restaurants in Cambridge, go to the public schools and get it. And I think there's this great opportunity to really bring back, you know, to indoctrinate uh, at a young age, um, students um, at the institutions to, to kind of really bring back that culture of local food. Um, and, you know, the idea, apples are great. I eat apples all the time. And those are, the, you know, those are like the, the, the gateway into local, local food and institutions. But we forget that the center of our plate protein can be seafood um and you know as bill was saying and as everyone else knows and, and, and on, on the um, the harvesting and the fishing side is those large buyers that can be moved and turned quickly 
um, are so essential to the whole process because striped bass isn't year round. And even when it's in season, it's only two days or three days a week, depending on, on the regs that year. Um, but people need needs people eat every day and people are fishing every day. And so to, they have to align it up. The, the, the institutional buying is so critical, such a critical piece to it, both short term and long term. Yeah, um, I, I think you're, uh, some great questions coming up there and I, I want to tie it back into um, something that was raised a little bit earlier um, in a couple of different ways. One is, you know, Jamie, you talked about supply, but demand is really important too and making sure at institutions that that food isn't going to waste, that that's getting eaten and that, um, and that you can take advantage of all the seafood that um, is on offer in New England. Um, I'd love to hear the chefs talk a little bit more about the ways that they've been bringing more items onto the menu, especially things like kelp, which were maybe a little unfamiliar and some of the other species. How did you, how did you go about sort of building demand with students and have you seen actually seafood increasing? Because it's interesting across our population, seafood holds really steady in terms of how much we eat. And yet, you know, historically and culturally across so many different cultures that are here in New England, seafood's really important. So it's always kind of a curious thing to me that it seems so hard to move the needle on um, on, what, on the amount that we actually eat. Yeah, so we are doing, uh, so with the kelp, yeah. So we, we're using it in a, bunch, in a bunch of different ways. You know, I know that some of the speakers before had talked about uh, smoothies. So we've done that. We have done, um, we actually have, um, a chili, a vegan chili. Actually, it's a competition that we won um, a couple of years ago with uh, some uh, two different kinds. So we have the pureed kelp uh, in with the chili and then a little bit of uh, almost like a um, flash fried um, kelp on top, you know, as a garnish. Um, so we're just, you know, we're trying to introduce it, you know, where, wherever we can, things like that. Even just uh, taking the puree and incorporating it into a miso soup or maybe another, you know, sort of uh, soup, what we think. So um, dressings also, it's very easy to do. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, and the students have responded really well to it. Um, same with the fish, you know, I think we've, you know, we've, I think we've done a pretty good job of, of uh, bringing fish onto our menus. You can always find fish somewhere uh, in any of our dining halls on in any given day. Um, and, you know, and it, yeah, and it's, it's, it's been great. You know, the students enjoy it and, um, yeah. Kevin, do you see opportunity for increasing that even further? Yeah, uh, for the many places that I have worked in the short amount of time I've been in the business, uh, UMass Dartmouth down here, there is a large group of people that eat fish here. Um, you look at our dynamics and, and uh, the different people that we have here, um, Islanders, Cape Verdeans, Portuguese, they all grew up around here. And, um, you know, if I had, you know, most places, you rate, you, it would go chicken, beef, pork, fish. Um, but here at UMass, of course, chicken is number one. Um, pork is at the bottom and beef and fish will give it, give it a run for it. Um, when we were full, and what I mean is, you know, when we were serving 7,000 uh, students a day, of course, things have changed dramatically uh, over the course, but uh, we have a lot of fish here and um, we can have the fish on the menu six or seven days a week where we might have only pork on two or three times. And that's a shift somewhere that I've never seen before. And um, especially if it's fresh. I mean, like uh, Tom said, Jamie came in one day and, and brought live, you know, I mean, um, whole fish, monkfish, and there was a few other types. And they brought in razor clams and scallops and stuff. And the students were absolutely amazed. They were taking their pencil and touching the, the scallop and watching it open and close and open and close and, and absolutely freaking out at the look of the monkfish. Um, but then we took all that fish in the back after lunchtime and we cleaned it all up and we served it all for dinner. And, um, and you could see them all putting the picture of the fish on their phone and showing their friends while they're eating a fish taco that was monk. So we have a, we, we do pretty good. I don't know if we can, you know, it's just so much, people that eat so much fish down here. I'm from Rhode Island too, and we have a lot of fish there, but this South Coast between um, New Bedford and Fall River, big fish eaters down here. Susie, one thing um, you were starting to raise is a little bit about um, distribution and some distribution challenges. I think that in seafood, um, processing, distribution tend to be um, alongside 
price and just, you know, questions about what people are eating um, do tend to be some of the biggest challenges that are raised in institutional supply chains. How do we get fish when we have so much abundant fish in New England? You know, what are some of the things that you, and I shouldn't just say fish, and kelp, of course, and other really wonderful shellfish and other aquaculture um, and, uh, and wild caught products? What, um, what do you see as some ways that we can kind of continue to work on some of those distribution challenges? You mentioned Farm Fresh Rhode Island or somebody did as like an opportunity to bring more into institutions, but also you know, some limits on how far they can reach with the kind of model they have. So just curious if you, there's um, things that are really working, things that you would like to see that you think have ability to scale, just kind of starting to throw that out there. Love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, sure, so Farm Fresh is definitely, uh they've been a, kind of a godsend for our farm. It really allowed us to have a reach that we otherwise would not have been able to have. Um, I, this year I've been uh, trying to get our seaweed at um, various different fish markets. And, um, you know, I thought about maybe partnering with seafood distributors who don't traditionally carry kelp. Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges that they had whenever I spoke to them was, you know, we don't we don't know enough about it and what to do with it and you know how to make sure we're going to be able to move it. So um, the one of the distribution challenges I have is also an educational challenge, um, and the uh, ability to stabilize it in order to kind of send it further has been a challenge, which um, the Kendall Foundation has actually been helping me meet by helping set up a processing facility on our marina site. So that's been actually a, a tremendous help and that'll also allow us to be able to send our seaweed further without fear of it contaminating um, en route in shipping. Um, it gives it a longer shelf life. Um, so, you know, I don't know, I don't know how to solve it. I do think that maybe it's taking advantage of um, infrastructure that already exists and I and collaborating as much as possible and partnering as much as possible. There's no sense in reinventing the wheel. There doesn't need to be a single seaweed distribution um, channel. It can be something that kind of piggybacks on already temperature controlled, uh, like, you know, fish, it, it seems like the perfect pairing, oysters, things like that. So I think it's just trying to figure out the best way to be really efficient about how we can go the furthest. Well, I can't raise supply chain um, and distribution challenges about giving Jamie a chance to weigh in. So Jamie, is there something you'd like to add into this? You know, I, um, I do. And I think, um, I think well, like a lot of people feel um, very intimidated with food service providers like a Chartwells or, or anyone on the Compass or um, like a Sidex or Aramarks. And, and I got to tell you, like, all right, so we work with, let's say, Smith College or Harvard University, and those are self-ops, and, and having that direct co collaboration is nice, but we have to find ways to get it in. But I got to tell you, like, when we got introduced, you know, we started working through Farm Fresh, which is brilliant. They're very helpful. We have great collaboration with them. We were introduced into the UMass Dartmouth and Northeastern, worked with, with Chef Tom, Kevin, and there's a, a two other ones as well, university as well. That opened the doors to get in Chartwells, and then once we got went through, you know, you have to you know, everybody has to trust each other. And once the kind of compass group trusted us and we trusted them, it opened the doors to be able to move so much fish at such an easy way because we have the broadliners that we're all aligned with. Um, and it's actually a really great thing to be able to collaborate. And it's, sometimes, a, you know, I think people who aren't involved in the food, you know, don't know a lot about this kind of food service providers think it's like this big giant bad guy corporation type thing. It's actually really efficient and it really works well to be able to Say, all right, I look in and I see the there's a code that I get through through Cisco, a broadliner, and it lists all the, the error mark, the chart wells, the fish of the day programs. Um, and I know each one has a little bit of some, you know, some want this fish or don't want that or, or, or whatever it may be. And to be able to just knock out all that fish in huge volumes and get it distributed within 24 hours by taking advantage of these kind of the broadliner Cisco or even the smaller version of like a smaller broadliner, like a farm fresh, being able to work and collaborate with them with the approval and in collaboration with, with like a Chartwells or a Sodexo, it moves so much volume and it is so beneficial than having to try to call up a hundred different universities uh, and put that order together, but to, to kind of consolidate it all. And I think sometimes we think kind of negatively the, the, you know, working with large groups or, or with large broadliners is a bad thing. Uh, I think if it's done properly, and I think within the seafood distribution, which you could probably say was a mess 30 years ago, 
it's one of the true models of efficiency right now of food distribution. I mean, we work, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but we work with probably 100 to 150 um, institutions of, of school and plus all the healthcare ones. And we're able to provide that fish every day. Um, and that took a lot of work and it took a lot of trust and we had to grow. It's not like just overnight it happened. But that is the ability, you know, Bill mentioned, you know, when, when we get his fish off the auctions, the auctions are, are a great asset for us for being able to really, okay, there wasn't a lot of white fish caught on the cake from the smaller boats. We can scoop that up because we know that chart wells is good for, you know, between them all, all the chart wells will good for about three, 400 pounds on a, on a rainy Tuesday. Uh, and that's really beneficial. And so there's, there's these models that are forming right now that is really, that might sound super nerdy. It's just really exciting to kind of see it form and, and see that it's actually going, it's really progressing into the future. So um, there's these great opportunities there once kind of everyone gets to trust each other and figure out how to work with each other to grow uh, on all parts of the equation. Yeah. All right, Bill, did you want to jump in? Yeah, um, I was going to say, um, I help a lot. No, but, um, uh, one of the, in my dealer permits, my state dealer permit does not allow me to fillet fish. So one of the, and I had a CSF. So what I would do is I bring people in and I would train, I would teach them how to play the fish. But, but when you asked me to come here and, and you said it was for institutions, I said, we got a problem because, because I'm not allowed to play the fish. And I know that's what they want. And I think that's why Jamie being a middleman can do that. He, he, from me, one way or another, he would get, receive the fish. He can, he can process it. He can play it and he can fix it for the institution, however they want. And then, and then deliver it out. I, 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 in order to go fishing, I've, I got to sell my fish, fix my boat and go out again. Sell my, and so marketing is a hard thing, you know, and, and one of the things that used to really kill me is that uh, I, I had a CSF. And so I would be waiting at my boat for someone to come and uh, pick up their fish. And uh, they were supposed to be there at one o'clock and, and I'd gotten in maybe by noon. And uh, my wife would call me up at two o'clock and says, when are you coming home? I said, well, the people haven't come to get the fish yet, you know? And so four or five o'clock, they finally come. Well, I want to leave the next morning to go fishing. So my opportunity with my family was gone because I was waiting for this person who was late to come and get their fish. But, but by being able to Jamie take it, then he can distribute it. He can divide it up and, and the system, I'm able to fish more. And, and, the, and, and I think the institutions are able to get flayed fish or however they want it done. And, and it really helps the whole process. Thanks, Bill. Well, I know I could keep asking you questions and talking with you all for hours and it would help me with my work too. But, um, but I also, um, we have about five minutes left officially for our panel discussion. And then um, we're gonna open it up to questions and answers from the audience. Uh, so I'd like to give each of you kind of a moment for a last word, even though it's not the last word, because we're going to still take questions and answers, but anything that you want to make sure that you have an opportunity to say to this audience that we have, knowing that it's a pretty diverse group out there. We've got people working in the seafood industry. We have people working for nonprofits and institutions, folks who are not very familiar with seafood and have lots of questions. So I've got a lot of folks out there. What is it that you'd like to just continue to, um, what sort of last points would you like to share before we, we wrap this panel up? Um, I'm going to go in reverse order this time. So I'll start with, uh, with Kevin. Jeff, Kevin? Yeah, I, I like to just um, what Barton said and, and also what Brianna had said earlier is that, you know, what the white fish is the white fish, you know, and, and try to introduce that it's not that hard, it can be good. I mean, a quick story is last the other last week, my son, I, I bought some haddock and he cooked some haddock and last night he was going to cook some cod and he said, Dad, I don't know how to cook this. I said, yes, you do. You cooked the white fish a couple of weeks ago, you know, Um and of course we have fish quite frequently. And I, and I just think that at this level where we are in Tom and uh, Mass Maritime and is that they just, um, we have such a captive, a captive audience. And um, you know, if we can have a couple hundred students that are 19 or 20 years old realize that the fresh seafood is right here on the South Coast, it's a generational change. Maybe they'll bring that home. And when they start raising their kids, I think it's, it's going to be a change and we just keep pushing forward with it. Uh, that's what I have. Thanks. All right. Um, Tom, Jeff, Tom, what would you like to add? Well, um, yeah, I mean, everything that I would say, you know, Kevin said, but also, you know, 
as, as it's already been said, but the, you know, our success, I think is, is the fact that we can get this product, this fresh, great local product that supports the community, support, supports, you know, folks like Bill and Susie, and, you know, that we, we can get this from our broadline distributor, which, you know, to some may sound, okay, great, you know, what does that mean? But like I said, in the, in, you know, we kind of, during the introduction, not wanting to poke the bear that is our sort of, you know, corporate purchasing or procurement, you know, can, can be sometimes difficult. So I think they've seen the light. Um, and, you know, I think, I think there's a great, great success story. And that we're committed to, you know, I know here, can't speak for everyone, but, you know, here at Northeastern, we're committed to serving, you know, sustainable local products wherever, whenever we can. Like many of us, you know, take the rest of the afternoon and talk about some of those other, you know, sort of non seafood products. But, um, yeah, but we're commi committed to doing that. And, um, I, and I think the students really enjoy it. Thanks. We really appreciate that commitment and all those efforts and for you sharing them today. All right, Jamie. Yeah, to jump on what Bill had just said, he doesn't have time to do his own marketing. And I think that's something we kind of overlook. Again, this is wild seafood. This is wild food. It's the only wild food we really have in our diet. Fiddleheads, ramps, I'm not going to count that. It's just not enough out there for us. But fishermen don't have the time to go out and market themselves. And wild fish aren't marketing themselves. You know, there's a lot. Of, every other food source we have has these big, huge marketing and advertising firms saying, buy this, buy this, buy this. Our local cash crop, one of our biggest resources in New England, we don't have any promotion of it. And so one of the, and you know, then there's this concept that people have that, well, kids don't eat fish. I mean, that's just the most absurd thing ever. Unless the physiology of humans have changed over versus the last several thousand years, everybody eats fish. It's very normal, very healthy. And so we've kind of had, we go, a lot of institutions go into this mentality, well, kids don't eat fish. You know, we're not going to bother that they want chicken nuggets. It's just not true. It's totally not true and we and Tom and Kevin everybody has seen this that when you get folks excited when you say hey it's not a frozen fish stick but this is real fish and the chefs are into it they don't know what it is and there's all these great stories and when you have chefs talking to the students about it it gets exciting and and, and Bill if, if you can ever take a day off and I know it's asking a lot like like anybody has extra time especially a fisherman has free time but and when things open up, what we do is we go into these institutions and we set up tables. And, you know, Kevin had mentioned we have you know, razor clamps squiggling out. Whatever lands that morning, I pull off the pier and go in. And you look at a, a seven-year-old, a 17-year-old, or, or even a 57-year-old, and they're handling a slimy, grotesque monkfish, and they're loving it. And it really changes the whole thing. And then we started bringing fishermen in. Again, once it's safe for this to happen, come in with us and hang out at the table. And, you know, people will be asking you know, questions about fishing. And at the end of the day, what you see is you see the, the whole supply chain at that table. Um, and people realize they get it. Students get it and they understand this is what local food looks like. This is what a community food supply looks like. Uh, and having that opportunity to put it together. And plus, it makes the chefs look great. Um, and that's what we want to do. Like, we want not just not just the Kevin and Tom's, but all the front line, you know, the the, the, from anyone who's scooping out the fish to the prep cooks, the line cooks, we get them all involved so that everybody looks like the hero. Uh, and it really, really brings out a positive feel. And we have seen this, you know, at some of the schools, like some of the public schools we work with, where they started with 40 pounds of fish and, and Billy, it's, it's amazing. You see the students going crazy for it and the next order is up to 70, 80 pounds. Um, so, you know, maybe after this is over, we should talk sometime down the road. It'd be really cool. You can see who's eating your fish. Uh, it'd be a great experience for you. And that's something I think with local food, with fishing, um, again, it's hard to have a fisherman get a day off unless maybe it's bad weather. Um, the, the issue is, um, is we have this great opportunity to kind of show everyone that, that this is a really great opportunity to bring local food right into the forefront of, of institutional dining. Awesome. Bill. Sure. Oh, well, Jamie, I'll take you up on your offer. I'd be love to come and help you. I, 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 um, I just really enjoy that. I mean, I do, like you say, the interaction with others and people and and, uh, and when they would come down to the boat and they, they wanted cod, but I said, well, here, try, try, try hake or try uh, monkfish. Or I'd always throw something in or throw some rock crabs in or, you know, and, and uh, but um, uh, I, I just got to say is, is that in New England here, you're, you're right. This is one of the riches of the, uh, blessings that we have is we have a tremendous abundance of seafood and and kelp and and other things too and and um, um, there's a lot of things we haven't even really begun to develop in you know and there's there's a lot of 
uh, in some things that uh, there's a lot we can do, do still. And um, I, I just, uh, I guess I'm gonna say that uh, I, I'm, I'm really passionate about the seafood industry here. And, and uh, I think we're really blessed as a area. Great, those are great last, last final words for this, um, this panel. Um, and Susie, definitely last but not least. Um, well, thank you again. This was, this was really fun. I think that if I could, my last and final words would just be to, to, to eat kelp, um, just give it a shot. Uh, it's good, it tastes great, it's good for you. Um, it supports a local economy here in New England. Um, it's fantastic for the environment, which is something that uh, really will help uplift the fishing, that wild fishing industry. Um, so whether you're getting it from, you know, up in Northern New England, whether you're getting it from Southern New England, just eat kelp that comes from New England. Awesome, thank you. Um, thank each of you for joining us today and uh, sharing your wealth of knowledge and experience and expertise has been really great. Uh, like I said, I, I'd love to keep continue this conversation, um, but I'd also like to invite Kate and Bart back in with us to help answer some of the remaining questions from our audience. We did get a ton of questions through registration and we have a few more coming in right now. Um, so I can <laughs> joining us again. Uh, one, um, one question that came through um, both in the chat and in registration, I think was some questions around policy. So I think it was Brian Himmelblum um, said that we should really have like a fish to schools lunch program through NOAA, um, sort of like we have a, a, a really robust um, farm to schools program through USDA. And I think that we also, FINE has done some work looking at local food preference laws and the role that that can play in encouraging more, um, more markets for local food, uh, locally produced food products in throughout New England. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about the role that policy can play in all of this. We've really been spending so much time talking about the supply chain itself, but, um, but there are other supporting ways to help encourage this too. So I open that question up to anyone who would like to answer it. What are some policy mechanisms that you think can be helpful um, or that need to change to be helpful? Don't be shy, I'll call on you in a minute. Kate, do you wanna answer that? Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a question. shot to kick it off. Um, awesome. So I think that like you said, you know, USDA is like it handles all kind of all the farm incentive stuff. A lot of times when we think about our food system, seafood is often left out of the conversation. Um, there's like the agricultural food that's typically managed by a completely different entity. And that includes basically everything else. And when we think about food and that, and when we think about food policy or anything like that, a lot of times seafood is just separate from that conversation because it's managed by, in this case, you know, NOAA or the, you you know, in Massachusetts, Department of Marine Fisheries or, you know, Rhode Island DEM or like, you know, whoever the agency is that's kind of managing those fisheries is separate from who's dealing with the rest of the food. And so I think a lot of times in policy, seafood gets left out of the conversation kind of completely. Um, and I think that in order for it to really, you know, I think we should be, since seafood is such an important part of our economy um, here in New England in particular, it should be included in all those food system conversations and policy conversations alongside those other foods. I think a lot of times it's just forgotten about. That's a great point. Anyone else want to want to talk a little bit about policy solutions? Susie? Um, I would just want to throw in that uh, focusing on um, what your food source is doing to the environment and the impact that it's having um, to me is really important. You know, we got into the seaweed farm because we knew that it was going to kind of leave the ocean better than it was when we first started it. So uh, rewarding farmers who um, are, you know, doing the right thing, rewarding, um, you know, the fishermen who are doing the right thing out there through uh, whatever sort of incentives or credits or, um, you know, whatever the policymakers could come up with is definitely, you know, something that would I think help drive the industry's growth uh, and bring more attention to it and bring more awareness to it. And all of those things will wind up uplifting the whole industry. So. Kate, I kind of want to follow up on that point you brought up, um, which 
as someone who's sort of come from the seafood world into this regional, more broad, broad food conversation, I think one of my goals is to tie those in a lot more closely together. And I would love to ask all of you, like just show of hands, um, how many of you have been part of some kind of local, state, or regional food, like general food planning kind of a conversation. So for example, maybe something spurred by a food policy council or like Massachusetts has a really great um, food systems uh, planning process. Other states are developing food systems planning. Rhode Island even has a director or has had a director of food systems and is looking to refill that position. How many of you have been part of conversations led by folks like that and been, been able to really see seafood integrated into that conversation? Show of hands. So it's the nonprofit folks that have been part of that conversation. And I just think that that's a great point to call out. And I'd love to actually kind of float that back out to everybody else is what are some ways if, if, if folks like Kate and I are there in some of these conversations in the middle, what can we do to better invite you into those conversations? What makes it possible? And would you even be available? I know you're, you've got day jobs too. <laughs> you're trying to move seafood um, and, and sea greens. So I'd love to just sort of hear a little bit about how we can make sure that we're making space for you all to be part of those conversations. Bill, why don't I start with you? I mean, you're on the water a lot. As you said, you know, you've got to really think about your timeline and where you, your time and where you put it. How can we engage, better engage fishermen and fishing voices in these conversations? What? <clears throat> um, that, that's kind of a difficult thing because most, at least in, in, in my fishermen, um, the guys go down, the, a, a, a politician comes down to the dock to do a, a television thing and all the fishermen run the other way and they'll point over to me. But, um, but I was going to say uh, a thought I had, I think maybe on the last one you had there too, is that, that a, a lot of management decisions are made with no consideration of the market or the, or the uh, it's just purely on uh, 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 you know, fish stocks. Uh, not that, that that those are certainly important, but but there's no consideration for how is the fisherman going to make it, or how is the Jamie going to make it, or or um, and uh, and a lot of them are, are I feel are, are really strict or far uh, far harder than are necessary. You know, and so, but there's no representation. Let's put it that way, of of uh, on decisions made, management decisions made that are that don't reflect um, the the the. I think the fishermen and the dealers in the markets. You know that that uh, that's something I think NOAA needs to improve themselves on. Bill, I think that's a really good point. And I think that, you know, one of the things for them to be able to do that and to be able to take into consideration kind of the mark, like they do trial surveys and, you know, all the different surveys to understand the fish docks and the ecological happenings. But once that fish kind of hits the dock, then it becomes kind of private information for each of those dealers, businesses and stuff like that about where that seafood goes, the supply chain and that kind. You might have the, the, like the boat price, but you don't have kind of how that seafood is translating up the supply chain. I think to understand those supply chains and the rest of like where that fish is going is an important aspect in understanding that market um, and would be important for, you know, those decision makers to take into consideration as well. And to help, you know, realize what fishermen are gonna be dealing with in terms of markets if they do these certain acti actions. Um, we have a right question now. coming in from Molly Letkovich, um, who, who's speaking of sort of uh, leadership and a voice in leadership and decision-making. Um, she says, are there any thoughts regarding the new head of commerce being from Rhode Island? Will that lift attention to the importance of sustainable fresh US seafood for US food security? It hasn't risen to that in past administrations. Um, so I, I, I'd love to know if you guys think that having someone in that kind of a leadership position from New England and who's, who's had some, um, you know, some, who's paid attention to uh, regional seafood. How important is that, do you think?
Bill, what do you think? I was I sort of started to talk over you, so I'm going to give you a chance to either weigh in with your well, last minute or answer that. Um, well, I was just going to say, I, I, one of my big complaints with uh, with um, our management by National Marine Fisheries Services, they don't understand the finances of fishing, you know, or an end from then on. But um, yeah, the, uh, those would be great. I hope so. That would be wonderful for to get some uh, some press instead of we can get a lot more attention in Alaska or something like that. Um, that would be great. We've had a couple questions for the chefs too, sort of just kind of bringing it back down to sort of that um, really practical level. Um, we had some questions about um, Chef Kevin, what you did with the monkfish in that throwdown, and also whether you ever work with dried seaweed. Um, any other varieties like sea lettuce? Um, and do you, any barriers that you have either dealt with or, or have heard others dealing with in terms of seaweed being incorporated into institutional kitchens? So two sort of big questions there. Maybe, maybe Kevin, you can start with the monkfish and we'll let Tom answer the question about other kinds of seaweed products. And yeah, um, yeah, we um, we worked with uh, down in New Bedford with um, Laura Orleans was in on this also, and um, we were up against another school. And um, so what it was, it was a, a small competition, and we were, there was a it was done at a farmer's market. So when the uh, fishermen came with the cooler and opened it up and pulled the monkfish out. We, we had $25 that was given to us and we had to run through the farmer's market and gather the ingredients that we wanted um, to make the dish. But we were allowed to bring a few items with us. So knowing uh, that uh, New Bedford had a strong Portuguese uh, following down there, I figured if I cooked any fish with chorizo, I would win. And, um, and that's surely what I did is I... Uh, I had my sous chef with me, uh, Chef Helda Costa, who lives in New Bedford. And um, we threw together quickly. I cleaned the fish. I took that center backbone out and made a quick stock. And he threw all the vegetables together. And um, we threw the fish in because monkfish can be very forgiving. It's not, it's, you can't really overcook monkfish. And um, we threw it all together in a stew. And I had made a little bit of a basil cherry tomato salad. And so I had like this soup and salad in August and, um, and it was great. It was a uh, simple, so we call it, you know, I, I've worn it out. I can't believe you asked me about this because <laughs> everywhere I go, people ask me and some of my friends and uh, others I work in the business say, listen, you're, you're kind of wearing that out, <laughs> leave that alone. But uh, it was just like, a, I would say like a New Bedford fisherman stew. Um, and again, like Barton said, it could have any strong white fish in it, uh, as long as you had cerise in it. <laughs> You're making me super hungry right now because I've worked through lunch. <laughs> it sounds amazing. Um, Chef Tom, I'm actually going to pause on that question because we have only about five minutes left before we want to just kind of wrap things up and, and sort of share some of our final, final information with folks. So, um, there's, and there's one sort of really important question that was asked in registration and earlier on, and I don't want to end without asking this, um, and it really deserves some time. But before I do that, I do want to just say thank you again to all of you and to all of our speakers, to Kirby for helping host and pull this together and her vision for kind of pulling all of this together from the very get-go. Tons of work. This has actually been years in the making in some ways. And so really grateful that you're all joining us today. We've had this amazing audience with great questions. Thank you. And I hope we continue this conversation. When we um, switch out of the panel, we will um, be sharing some other ways for you to continue to engage in these kind of really important questions. So I hope you'll stay tuned. Um, so my final question is one that um, actually has less to do with seafood in the oceans and more to do with the people. And that's the fact that um, you know, equity is, is, is a really big issue in the food system. And it's something that we need to be talking more about. And I think that um, there's all kinds of things we can point to in this panel where, we, where, where, where it's, it's sort of raised already. Um, and that is that we have an aging population of fishermen. We don't have as many young people entering that, um, that field anymore. We have many cultures, as we've talked about, who rely on seafood and fish, and yet, you know, we're not necessarily seeing many of them represented even in today's discussion. And so I think that it's really important to think about what is, how are we all working on addressing this um, in our own work? So I'd really love to open that question up to folks and see 
what you think about being able to, um, to really make the whole sort of seafood movement a much more inclusive and equitable um, platform for people and, um, and also, you know, then translating that into what that looks like in terms of how we're feeding people. So it's a huge question, it takes more than five minutes, but I would love to just open that up and hear what you all think about that. Jamie, I I, oh, go ahead, Susie, I'll, and then I'll come to you after that, Jamie. So go ahead, Susie. I think a big part of it is making, um, making that, you know, that lifestyle, the choice uh, viable, something that where you, can, you can actually make a living. You're not going to try to pursue a career in something where you feel like you're just going to be grinding constantly. Uh, in spite of the fact that being on the water is the most glorious thing in the whole wide world, like you, we all have bottom lines that we want to meet. And that's why one of, um, that's where I think that that kind of pairing of uh, seaweed cultivation with the fishing industry can be a beautiful thing because it does add an additional revenue stream. It helps preserve the working waterfront, which I mean, once that goes away, the fishing industry is not going to be that far behind it. So, um, you know, that's just if we can make a living wage, if we can live a life and raise a family, then I think that more people will be drawn to it. Yeah, thank you. And I, I also want to say I'm, I'm, you know, I'm incredibly grateful to you and Brianna, two really what amazing women who are running companies here in New England and building businesses. You know, seafood also has a bit of a gender parity issue. So I'm really grateful to have you here and folks like Kate who can speak to all of this as well. So thank you for joining us today. Um, Jamie, I think that, you know, you're in a business that, um, that sees a lot of people kind of coming through and, and employs a lot of folks. I'm wondering how you are all sort of thinking about diversity, equity, and also making sure that seafood's getting to all communities. Well, I think it's easier. I think, I don't know how to say how to make more fishermen, period, let alone how to make the fishing industry more inclusive. It's unfortunately, there's a lot less fishermen. Um, just like up to 20 years ago, there was a lot less farms. It was always going down. I think only recently, there were small farms that are growing. Um, so I, I, I gotta be honest, I have no idea how to get more folks involved uh, in the seafood industry um, from that perspective. I can say that as far as what we are doing to make seafood as far as people who eat it making more inclusive and not exclusive is is really one of the, uh, I think to really connect it to this conference is public schools. I think uh, you look at the ability that even at the smallest price point, I mean, most public schools budgets are, are less than like what, what a Taco Bell special is. I mean, it's criminal how, how little we're actually investing into what the, the free lunch that goes on. Um, and so I think we, I think are very conscious that we are gonna spend as much time and energy in Springfield public schools, Providence public school systems as we are at Harvard University or Northeastern that there is so much importance to kind of allow, and again, I, I, was, I, I say this, uh, the, the greatest pride I have is being able to tell people before COVID was around that some of the freshest seafood you can get is at, you know, Morse Grammar School um, right off of Memorial Drive in Cambridge, or, you know, going down into Providence Public Schools with dog fishing, bringing in dog fishermen and spending every single lunch uh, at a couple of different schools, uh, hanging out with the students and getting them excited about it and being able to come up with uh, a program that gives a living wage to the fishermen, but allows you know these these tiny budgets um, to to bring it in to come up programs to allow that, uh, and then to make sure that that's, that that students um, get, have the ability to access these fishermen, to access the the monkfish and that excitement. Um, and and it's not that you know a wealthy white suburban public schools doesn't deserve that attention. Of course, we're going to spend our time there as well. Uh, but we really do focus on the idea that that it's not just good business, but it's a smart way of building community and making seafood exclusive is by making sure that at least who is eating it and where it's going to uh, is, is, uh, is, is inclusive and is equal access to it. Um, and that's, I think, one of the, the ways I can speak very positively where, where, where not just at Red's Best, but within the fishing industry, we are, we are able to make actual true inroads. Thanks, Jamie. Um, like I said, we're, we really just started to scratch the surface on so many of these things. And we really hope that you all continue to think about all these really big issues that we've been, um, we've been talking about. Grateful for all your time. And um, with that, I would like to hand things back over to Kirby.
All right, thanks, Tanya. So before we end today's event, I do have some final announcements. Please consider donating to the Fishing Partnership Resiliency Fund. We talked a lot about the struggles of fishermen and the struggles of not just COVID-19, but being a fisherman as a whole. So this fishing partnership is a nonprofit dedicated to improving the health, safety, and economic security of commercial fishermen. Founded in 1997, they bring a critical support service and program to more than 20,000 New England fishing families. And your one-time or reoccurring donation contributes to our safety at sea training programs, health and wellness programs, economic assistance programs, substance abuse and recovery workshops, mental health services, and so much more. So please answer the call today. This summit was free of charge and everybody is able to view the recording of this. So if you are able to, it would be great if you could check it out. Also, the next slide, very big, save the date for the 2021 Northeast Farm to Institution Summit coming this April. The event strengthens the regional food system by celebrating and supporting the role of institutions as anchors in the region. The summit generates ideas and connections that advance the viability of regional farm, food, sea businesses, and healthy, just communities. The summit welcomes both newcomers and pioneers to share their work, make connections, generate energy, and co-create strategies for addressing the most pressing challenges for our regional food system. The summit will be held on the first three Thursdays in April, April 1st, 8th, and 15th, 2021. And sponsorship opportunities are available as well if you're interested. So schedule and registration will be going live this week. And for more information, you can find it on f2isummit.org, the fine website, which will be posted in the chat. And there's some also great resources right now, like the Ocean Changemakers Challenge. If you're interested, the Economics Group World Ocean Initiative just launched this challenge to showcase leading changemakers working to develop business solutions to ocean-related sustainability challenges. It's aimed at early career researchers or professionals. So if you're interested in learning more about all these great resources, and this includes the great cookbook that the four partner university chefs created from Northeastern, Mass Maritime, UMass Dartmouth, and Eastern State Connecticut. All of that is all on our website, the Sea Summit from farm to institute.org, um, Sea Summit backslash Sea Summit, the same page that you registered. So once again, thank you for joining the Sea Summit. And a huge thank you to our planning team, FINE, the New Bedford Fishing Heritage Center, and our project partners and funders. Thank you to our speakers and panelists, and have a great evening.